As you can see, the theme up there is Mardi Gras and us. And you'll see two passages of Scripture, so I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, as always, but open your Bibles to these two passages of Scripture. Find 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and just mark that. And after you found 2 Corinthians chapter 6, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2. We need to read what God's Word has to say. And I think if we read what God's Word has to say, we're going to find out what we need to do regarding Mardi Gras. How we should allow it to impact our lives and what we should do with it. I know what I'm going to say today is probably not going to make everybody happy. But that's all right. God didn't put me here to make everybody happy. Uh, just proclaim His Word and let His Word speak. You know, I... I'd, I'd heard about Mardi Gras a long, long time, but I didn't know what it was really all about and a bunch of parades and celebration and festivities and all of that. And so some years ago, I said, well, yeah, I need to find out where it came from, the history of it. What's, what's it all about? You, you ask the average person that's going to be out on the parade routes this afternoon, well, what's Mardi Gras? Oh, it's fun. <laughs> it's, it's beads and it's parades and, and all this good sun stuff, the candy they throw to us. It's just good old innocent fun. It is fun, there's no doubt about that, but is it innocent fun? On the surface, yes. Uh, you're probably not going to see anything this afternoon if you were to go to the parade that you wouldn't say is good, innocent fun. You wouldn't see anything terribly wrong with it. But what is Mardi Gras? Why, why do we have those parades? Why do we have all the fancy balls and, and all the other activities? What, what's that really all about? Where did it come from? Well, Mardi Gras is means Fat Tuesday. When I first found that out, I said, boy, do I qualify. <laughs> I've lost a few pounds since then, but I, I really qualified more then than I do now for Fat Tuesday. I said, well, I was fat on Monday and Wednesday too, so I don't understand what that's all about. And so I had to look it up, and I found out that Fat Tuesday has to do with Ash Wednesday, which has to do with Lent. And it took a while for me to learn what that all was so today we're going to look at it, and you may say, well, I already know all of this. Hallelujah, if you do. But if it's not, maybe we'll enlighten you a little bit. We've got to begin with Lent to understand Fat Tuesday uh, and Mardi Gras. Lent comes from the old English word, lengthen. It means to lengthen, and it has to do with the lengthening of the days, or springtime. It's a springtime festival. And Easter has always been celebrated during the spring because... Easter is connected to the Passover feast, which Passover is the, the Jewish celebration of God's delivering them out of the land of Egypt. And that is always celebrated in the springtime. And Jesus was crucified at the Passover season. And so we celebrate Easter in conjunction with the Passover calendar, the Jewish calendar, which is always celebrated in the month of Nisan. And Nisan is on the Jewish calendar, not our Gregorian calendar. Are you still with me? Okay, it, 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 the connections are there. And so Lent or lengthen fits. Days are getting longer when the celebration takes place. Forty days prior to Easter were set aside by the Catholic Church in 325 A.D. as a time to focus on Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Say 40 days from now we are going to be celebrating Good Friday. And we're going to be celebrating Easter Sunday. And so between now and then, we want to spend 40 days getting our hearts right with God. And that's a good thing. We need to focus on Jesus' crucifixion, His resurrection. We need to examine our lives, which is what this is about, what the 40 days of Lent is all about. Examine our lives, repent of the sins that we find in our lives, and get closer to God. Nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Well, how do you get closer to God? And, and in the tradition, it came, well, in order to get closer to God, I've got to get farther away from the world and things that have occupied me and things that satisfy my flesh. So I'll give up some worldly pleasures. We'll, we'll give up some things. We'll do some fasting of certain items out of our lives that I really enjoy. Maybe it's cake or maybe it's pecan pie or whatever it might be. And, and abstaining from meat, from alcohol, from sex, from certain types of entertainment. They say, well, 
I'm not going to watch any kind of sport on TV. And every time a program comes on, normally I would be watching a ball game or whatever it is on TV. I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to spend some time alone with God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. Boy, that's a good thing. And, and I've got nothing at all to say bad about that at all because it, the, the attention is to bring us closer to God. During that period of time of Lent, people attend worship services more often than normal, read the scriptures, improve their prayer lives. And you may say, well, okay, I got that part, but why, why is it 40 days? Where, where'd, they get, where'd that come from? Well, in the Bible, we find several instances of 40 days, particularly having to do with Jesus fasting and praying in the wilderness for 40 days. So that, that's the reason for the pattern. So it's, it's, a, it's a type of a fast of, of denying our flesh for 40 days prior to Easter. The 40 days begins on what is called Ash Wednesday. Now, if you were not raised in the Roman Catholic tradition, you wouldn't know what in the world Ash Wednesday is all about. I wasn't, and I had to learn. I remember the first time, years and years ago, I was just a youngster. And, well, I wasn't that young, but I was, I don't know if I was ever that young. But I was working and, and living in Beaumont, and, and I traveled into Louisiana, and, and there was one time I was over here, and I was on business, and I went, and I saw some people, and they had this black smudge between their eyes on their forehead. And I said, oh, you, you, you probably don't know this, but you, you got something. <laughs> they explained to me, this is Ash Wednesday. I said, okay. Why do you, what that got to do with that, you, you need to watch that. No, you don't No, you don't understand. They had to explain it to this ignorant Texan, okay? Baptist Texan at that. So that made it harder to understand that Ash Wednesday, the tradition is that a priest or a bishop will take the ashes from the burnt palm leaves from preceding year on Palm Sunday, those ashes are saved and they're placed as a cross on the forehead of worshipers to remind us we're beginning the season of Lent. We look at each other and we see the cross. And I said, ah, now I know what Ash Wednesday is all about. It begins Lent. So the question is, is Lent biblical? And the answer is no, it's not biblical. It's a religious custom observed by many Christian denominations. Ash Wednesday. Is that biblical? No, it's, it's not biblical either. Again, it's a religious custom and it's related to Lent, the beginning of the Lenten season. Say, so, Okay, so now we get from Lent to Ash Wednesday to the day before Ash Wednesday is Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. You notice that's one day. Well, we've stressed that out. It's a carnival. It's another word that is used many, many times uh, in reference to what we call Mardi Gras. Other cultures, other parts of the world, they just call it carnival. And it stretches out to where it's not just Tuesday, but Monday before and the Sunday before and the Saturday before and the Friday before. That's how it is right now. This, we're in the carnival uh, season, the Mardi Gras season right now, if you don't believe that's true. How many parades have we already had in Lake Charles and how many more we've got coming? So it's, it's more than just one day. It's a celebration, a carnival celebration that precedes the fasting or the limiting, the denying of the flesh in order to focus on the spiritual, focus on the Lord Jesus that begins on Wednesday. So it starts on Tuesday. Or actually it focused on Tuesday originally. It originally started on Tuesday. So the question comes up, is Mardi Gras biblical? And evidently, you know the answer. No, it's not. There's nowhere in the Bible that says celebrate Mardi Gras. So, okay. But these are all traditions that have been handed down through the centuries and have grown one way or another in one culture or another. Say, okay, well, Brother Allen, are, is there anything really wrong with the parades? I mean, is there something wrong with a parade? And the answer is no, there's nothing wrong with a parade. People marching down the street, people riding on a folk, people throwing out gifts and things like that. Unless you get hit by something that hurts you. It's, it's, if you catch a bead that's worth nothing and you get a whole bunch of them, you got a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> you, you didn't get, you know, that's not bad. Nothing sinful about catching plastic beads that don't have any value to them. It's just kind of fun to catch them. 
And if they throw those little paper, cu those plastic cups, you got to have those because you caught something more than the beads, right? And if they throw out those little footballs, now you've got something. Did you ever try to play a game of football with one of those little footballs for more than about an hour? It just it gets destroyed. So it, it's kind of harmless, and yet it's, it's a matter, the idea of getting something for nothing and having fun, hooping and hollering, hearing the music and seeing the parade go by. Parades within themselves, there's nothing really wrong with them. But the problem is, on Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, many are trying to cram as much fun, as much physical pleasure, and literally as much sin as they can on the day before they have predetermined that they're going to give them up on Wednesday. And there's the problem. Carnal of all, carnal, the flesh. The last part of that word comes from a word that means to elevate the flesh, to lift it up. So what takes control on Tuesday? The flesh. Is it spiritual? No. It's not spiritual. Nobody's focused on Jesus out there on the parade unless somebody forces a gospel tract in their hand. And that, that's not going to happen this year unless somebody else does it. We've been guilty of doing that for quite some time here. And it's amazing the response you get from people out there regarding that. But that's another story. No, it's, it's elevating the flesh. On Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, there's so many people thinking, well, it's okay to get as drunk as I want to today because tomorrow I'll repent of it and everything's going to be fine and I'll be living a good Christian life after that. I can misbehave as much as I want to because this is Fat Tuesday. I can act like a pagan as much as I want to. It's Mardi Gras time. That's what we do at Mardi Gras time. I can do that because tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, beginning of Lent, and I'm going to have to behave. I'm going to have to act like a Christian, but not tonight. <laughs> oh, but not tonight. It's Mardi Gras. Floats, the beans, the, the, the beads, the doubloons, the candy, they're all harmless. The music and the dancing is sometimes questionable, depending on what it is. But the drunkenness is wrong. I don't care if you're drunk on the street or drunk at home or drunk in a bar. It's wrong. The debauchery is wrong. People think of that on the reference to Mardi Gras. They think, well, hey, you're just talking about New Orleans. No, I'm not. You don't have to go that far to see it. If you were to go to New Orleans, it's real, real easy to see the demonic influence on what's taking place in Mardi Gras. It's really obvious. So we get to the question, is it wrong for Christians to participate in that, to participate in Mardi Gras? Have you, have you ever attended the Mardi Gras parade in Lake Charles and seen anything that looked evil? I have on many occasions. We, when we would attend those parades, it would be for the sole purpose of sharing the gospel. We used to print and pass out, and along with a couple of other churches, of up to 20,000 gospel tracts on Tuesday night. That's a lot of people needing Jesus and having the good news placed into their hands. And up to that is up to them and the Holy Spirit what they do with it. But for year after year, that number of came down and down and down until this year the printer was unable, unable to print them at all. I regret we're not able to do that this year. But I can tell you over 25 years of doing that, we saw Satan worshipers open on the street, proclaiming who they were worshiping, carrying their pet rats, wrapped over their snakes. I worship the devil, trying to look like him with the horns, the whole bit, with the pentagrams and all of it. You would have thought you were in the middle of a witch's coven or something or something. And it, there were certain parts of the street on Ryan Street. I can take, them to, take you to them right now where every year well, there's going to be a group of them here. Go down another block, there'd be a group of them there. Is that evil? Oh, yeah. Could see underage drinking up and down Ryan Street, encouraged by adults and condoned by the police. Smell of marijuana filling the air. Mardi Gras, have a good time. It's okay because tomorrow's Ash Wednesday to begin Lent. But tonight, tonight,
tonight's different. Partial nudity, yes. Groping, fondling, debauchery on Ryan Street, folks. It's in our city. Don't think it's just removed down to New Orleans or someplace else. It's here. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearances of evil. And what does the Lord tell us in 1 Peter chapter 1? Verse 15 and verse 16, he says it twice. Be ye holy. Can you picture yourself participating in what was going on that I just described, being holy? Nothing holy about it. It's as unholy as it can be. The flesh, driven by the power of Satan, spitting in the face of God, saying this is part of our religion. This is what we're going to do because tomorrow we're going to get right with you, but God tonight, leave us alone. Oh, You may say, well, Brother Allen, you're talking to the wrong person because I don't do that. I don't drink. I don't do those things that you described. I'm not a worshiper of Satan. I'm a Christian, and I don't do that. I, I just go to the parades and I catch the throws. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with my being in the crowd but not doing that other stuff? Let's let God's word answer that question. Second Corinthians, if you would, please. And chapter 6. Verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And usually we read this in reference to a Christian marrying a non-Christian. But he asked the question, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You're a Christian. You've been saved. You've been declared righteous by Almighty God. So you have the righteousness of Christ within you and upon you. So he's talking to you, Christian, and to me, Christian. He says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And the answer is none. Shouldn't have any fellowship at all. We're not in agreement with one another. How could we possibly have fellowship one with another? Then he says, what communion hath light with darkness? Go into a dark room, turn on a light. Is there communion there? Or does the darkness disappear as the light comes on? He says, what, what communion is there? Again, the answer is none. And in verse 15 he says, what concord hath Christ with Belial? And Belial is a pagan deity that they worshipped. He said, what, what part of concord does he have with that? None. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, Sometimes you were darkness, you were darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord and you're not darkness anymore, so you're not part of that. That's not what you are. Don't act like it. Don't act like what you used to be. Verse 15. What concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel is a non-believer. Real simple. It doesn't matter which religion you're talking about. The Muslims use that word for everybody that's not a Muslim, and they're the correct definition. Well, it's true for us, too. We're either believers in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. If you're a believer, you're not an infidel. If you're a non-believer, you're an infidel. So just the definition of the word. And he says, what part hath he that believeth with a non-believer? None. We're either believers or non-believers. You can't be both at the same time. No, it's one or the other. Verse 16 says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Christian, listen to me. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. He lives within you. I mean, don't, don't 
take that as a negative thing. That's a positive thing. That means you don't have to live like the rest of the world. You don't have to participate in ungodly stuff. You can be unique. You can be different. And yes, you can be holy in the eyes of God. You can make some holy choices, holy decisions, some holy actions, and be righteous in the sight of God. You can do it because He lives within you. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is within you? Don't you know that? Sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we say, well, I'm just a Christian, or I'm just a Baptist, or I go to church, or I'm a believer, or whatever. But wait a minute. You're not living by yourself anymore. Your heart's not empty anymore. The Holy Spirit is living within you. He said, don't you know that? Know for sure that the Holy Ghost is living within you. And your body is the temple where he is to be worshipped. I don't know about you. I can't, I can't worship the Lord on Ryan Street on Tuesday night. Can't do it. Maybe you can. Verse 17. All of this being true, all of these questions being asked, and the obvious answers are so obvious. Verse 17 says, here's the conclusion. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. In other words, the father's taking care of his children, saying, The Lord God Almighty. And look what he says in 7 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God says it pretty plain. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. saith the Lord. The Lord said what? Come out from among them and be separate. Who said it? The Lord did. The Lord Jesus, our Savior. We need to know personally the one that said it, not just what was said. So the question is, do you know the Lord Jesus? And, and that's far more important than knowing everything we just talked about, about Mardi Gras. All that means nothing if you don't need to know the Lord Jesus. But you need to know Him first and foremost. If you know about the Lord Jesus, everything you should know about the Lord Jesus, listen to me carefully, if you know everything you should know about the Lord Jesus, you will know that He can save you. Amen? Yes. But if you know Him, you know He has saved you. Amen. Because see, when He saves you, He moves into your heart and into your life, and you get to know Him personally, and He changes things. You're not the same after that. You can't be. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? That's the bottom line question. If you know him, you've trusted him as your Savior, you've become the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, he lives within you. Is that true for you? I mean, really, has it really happened to you? Do you know for sure it's happened to you? If you don't know for sure, you need to know for sure. You need to trust Jesus and receive Him as your Savior and your Lord today so you can know. Oh, my. Has Jesus saved you? If you say, yes, yes, He saved me. I know His Holy Spirit lives with me. I know I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. I may not know what all that means, but I know it's true because God said so. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. He has saved me. If you know for sure he has saved you, then I want to just point you back to what he said here. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Are you willing to do it? For some of us, that's going to mean a trip to the altar down here to kneel and pray at the old prayer altar we have. Maybe that's what it's going to take. Or maybe you say... I'm okay in all of this, Brother Allen. I really didn't need to hear all that from myself, but I needed to hear it to share it with somebody else. And maybe you want to come up here and pray for them this morning. I don't know. Or maybe you want to pray for them right where you are. But please, 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 pray for all of those who are celebrating Mardi Gras. Not knowing, not knowing who's really in control of it. It's not the Lord. It's obviously not the Lord Jesus in control of it. Oh, 
the initial plan of Lenten is wonderful. But what Satan has done is taken it and twisted it. And gullible men and women and children have accepted it. Parents love to see their kids happy. Throw me something, mister. Kid catches it, mom and daddy are happy. Next thing you know, mom and daddy are acting like kids because it feels good. But all the rest of it, when it crosses that line, there's no longer anything good about it. It's been caught in Satan's trap. So I'm going to plead with you to pray for people that have been deceived, people that are <laughs> caught in Satan's trap, that the Lord Jesus will deliver them. And I'll say, I don't need that. I have a joy in my heart that the Lord himself, and I, I don't need that to make me happy. Oh, I, I may need it more than 40 days to get right with God and see the pay, price that Jesus paid for me and, and go through something, that whether I call it Lent or something else. I, 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 need, I need to get closer to the Lord Jesus than I am now, and so I'm, again, I'm not putting that down at the slightest. We do it a little bit differently here. We call it revival. And you'll notice on your calendar in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be having revival services starting on a Saturday night. If you can see the spiritual need for yourself to be closer to the Lord Jesus, be more aware of the price that He paid for you and what He wants to do in your life and how you need to surrender it all to Him and maybe give up something and take on something new, revival's for you. And I'm not trying to sell a revival. I'm just telling you that we don't ignore it. We've got spiritual needs and all of us can be closer to the Lord than we are. So I'm asking you to do it. Would you bow your heads with me now as we pray? Oh, dear Father, I thank you for loving us the way that you do. And I thank you, Father, for sacrificing your son Jesus for us. Forgive us for not being closer to you than we are. I'm asking you, Father, to speak to the heart of anybody that's here today that has never received your Son as their Savior and Lord. Let them know it, even while we're praying. Let them know they need to be saved. They need to surrender it all to the Lord Jesus today that He might move into their hearts and life and be with them forever. And, Father, for those of us that have allowed the world and allowed the flesh to come take over too much of our lives, and I say us, Father, because I'm guilty too, may we repent of that. May we not wait till Wednesday to repent over what we know is wrong today. May we repent of those things in our lives that need to be repented of. May we surrender ourselves totally to you. Oh, God, have your way with each one of us now. And, Lord, give us love and compassion for others that need to do the same that maybe aren't here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.